I hope you can all hear me. Okay, so last week I couldn't share my email address with you. So I have shared it today at the beginning of the lesson itself. So when you join in, uh, as, as I said last week, please drop an email to that uh, email I have uh, shared to that email address. Please drop an email through your account. So we would start our usual weekend questions starting from this Sunday. So from tomorrow, 8 a.m you will get a question paper mostly usually what we do is we have about five mcqs and five essay type questions about the chapter we just discussed and finished so you all would attempt that on your own get back to me by friday and i would assess it i won't give you marks per se but i would individually assess your paper and mark where you went wrong even if it's your essay on what ways you could improve I would give my feedback to you individually okay so that's how it works so it will continue on a weekly basis all right so we'll start off our new topic for this week so from this week onwards we are starting to focus specifically on financial markets each type of market is going to be our focus what's happening in that market who are the participants in that market what kind of instruments are traded in that market all right so we are going to start off with money market before we start off as usual let's go through the summary that we discussed the very last chapter that we discussed we were going through fundamentals of financial markets that was our third topic our very first one was introduction to financial system and financial markets. Second was classifications of financial market. And the third topic was the fundamentals of financial markets. Okay. So in fundamentals of financial markets, we broadly looked into two aspects. One was interest rate and the other was the stock market efficiency or you could even call it informational efficiency okay so under interest rate we went through what interest rate is and why is it important to financial markets is it only important to debt market or does it have an impact on our equity market as well we went through that then what is nominal versus real interest rate what are the ways in which you could calculate interest rate there we saw simple and compound interest rate and then we moved into a much more serious topic how is this interest rate determined so just like all other there is demand and supply demanding uh, deciding determining what interest rate is okay but we had two theories to tell us what demand and what supply was residing this interest. The two theories were loanable funds theory and liquidity preference theory. So loanable funds theory said, look here, it's demand and supply for loanable funds that is deciding the interest rate. And we saw how the demand and supply curve are, you know, diagrammatically shown for such a theory liquidity preference theory said look here interest rate is determined based on yes demand and supply but for money so demand and supply of money is what decides interest rate so there we saw similar demand curve but a very different supply curve okay recall those while we go through this then we started addressing another big question we saw different securities having different interest rate and we wanted to know why so two concepts were explaining that to us one was risk structure of interest rate and the other was term structure of interest rate what was risk structure of interest rates telling us risk structure of interest rate was telling us look here even though maturity is the same that you get two or three instruments with the same maturity time, they're still going to have different interest rate. And this concept told us, why is that? It highlighted three reasons. It was differing credit or default risk. 
differing liquidity and difference in the informational cost. Those three were the reasons highlighted by the risk structure of interest rate. What is this term structure of interest rate? Term structure of interest rate was telling us, okay, even though you have two or more instruments which has similar risk and liquidity characteristics, maybe it's the same issuer issuing those uh, instruments with the same liquidity characteristics, but still they had different interest rates. And term structure highlighted that look here, even though the characteristics were the same in terms of risk and liquidity, you will still see differences in interest rate if the maturity date or the maturity time is different okay that was the focal point of term structure of interest rate so there we came across a important term yield curve what was yield curve highlighting to us yield curve was telling us the relationship between interest rate and the maturity how interest rate reacts when the maturity changes okay that was what the yield curve telling us but there was no set shape of yield curve now if i talk about demand curve demand curve for a product you know usually it has to be downward sloping but yield curve could take four shapes four types of yield curves were there upward sloping downward sloping flat and then you had bell or hump uh, yield curve. Okay, so we came across four yield curves and we saw what each of those shapes indicated to us. There was a certain message that you get when you see the shape of the yield curve. So we were understanding that through the shape of the yield curve. Then again, we came across different theories justifying why yield curve took these shapes or what this yield curve was actually telling us so there we had four theories expectations theory liquidity premium market segmentation and preferred habitat theory now these four we studied them in detail we also went through a summary in detail okay i have included that summary in your this week uh, note so it's easier for, for you all when you all revise through. Okay. Understand what is the key assumption behind these theories and what is the understanding that you get. Okay. Then we move to see what were the users of the yield curve. Yes, we know what a yield curve meant, but what's the point of studying a yield curve? Okay. That was our next area. Why do we need a yield curve? And then lastly, we saw. Can interest rates be negative? Especially last year, due to all this pandemic situation, if you have been reading financial news, you would have come across this ha who about whether countries have to move into and adapt negative interest rate. So can it be practically done? What is this negative interest rate? What are the positives? And what are the downfalls of having a negative interest rate? Okay, so all these we saw on the interest rate topic. Then last week, we focused on the informational efficiency. Our focus was mainly on the equity market. So there we saw how stock prices move when a information is released to the market. There is a certain way that the market should act. You call that efficient market. If the market was efficient, if the market was informationally efficient, then moment a positive or a negative news comes, the market should react immediately and to the correct extent, to the correct degree, okay, to reflect the fair or the true impact of that news, okay. That's what you call an informationally efficient market, okay. But then we saw there were situations where markets don't react that way. If in case of a positive news, there can be over or under reaction. In case of a negative news as well, there can be a over or under reaction. Okay. 
So whenever there was an over or an under reaction, we saw there was an opportunity for others, for informed investors to make an abnormal profit while the uninformed investors were suffering. Okay. So if there is an opportunity like that, can you call that market efficient? Where some people are profiting off the other? No, it's not efficient. It's not disseminating the information equally among all others. Okay, so that highlights the inefficiency in the market. Okay, so only when there is an inefficient market, there is an opportunity for informed investors to take advantage and earn an abnormal profit than the others. Okay, so studying about this efficient, uh, efficiency of markets, we came across this economist called Pharma, who introduced a hypothesis named efficient market hypothesis. His, his underlining premise was, yes, all markets are informationally efficient. He says, he says that as a statement, he says, yes, all markets are informationally efficient, but there is a certain type of information for which it is efficient. Okay, so depending on what type of information, the efficiency can differ. So he came across three efficiency levels. One was weak form of efficiency. Second was semi-strong form of efficiency. Third was strong form of market efficiency. Now understand this. In a strong form of market efficiency, the hypothesis highlights there is no room for abnormal returns. All information is highlighted in the market. It's highlighted in the prices of the stocks. So no investors, no, no any investors are able to earn an abnormal profit over the other. Okay, that happens in a strong form of market efficiency. But in a weak form and a semi-strong form, even though they are efficient, they are efficient to only one type of information. So there is an opportunity, there is a room for the informed investors to earn an abnormal profit. So weak form of information, weak form of market efficiency is efficient where prices highlight the past information. More specifically, the prices in such a market highlight the past trade information. So just because I know the past trade information, I am unable to outperform than the other investors. Because everybody knows. Everybody knows the past trade information. So just because I know that, I can't take an advantage over the other. That happens in the weak form of market efficiency. Okay. So that means this market is efficient for past trade prices or past prices. It also means, look here, if you have present information or if you have insider information, then oh, the market is not efficient for those information then yes, you have the ability to outperform the other investors in the market. Semi-strong form of market efficiency. It's a one step ahead of weak. Semi-strong form of market efficiency also highlights, yes, market is efficient. So for what information are they efficient? They are efficient for all publicly available information, which means past trade prices and current information as well. Whatever that is publicly known, publicly available to the people is reflected in the market prices. So I can't outperform the others by knowing the current information. By knowing what publi what's publicly available, I'm unable to outperform. That also means 
if you have insider information information about the company which others don't know then you have room to outperform the other investors okay i hope the three levels are clear to you and i also told practically in financial markets you see mostly semi strong form of financial markets why because you know trading based on insider information is unethical okay so in that scenario definitely market prices cannot reflect insider information so definitely it's not strong form market that is one point second point is even through research they have come across there is ability there is instances where knowing insider information has helped investors to earn a abnormal return than the others then that means that's a indication of a semi strong financial market so that's why the research highly uh, reflects that many of the markets are semi strong form of financial markets okay so i hope you are very clear about this area when we move into money market carry forward your knowledge that we learn from the first three topics okay money market we went through what a money market is under classification of financial markets what did we learn there we learned money market is a market for short term instruments remember instruments less than 1 year of maturity okay those were money market now that was a introductory area now we are getting into the in detail study okay that is a market for instruments which mature in one year or less than one year now tell me what kind of instruments mature in less than a year is it debt instrument or is it equity instrument it is debt instrument why can't equity mature in one year there are in the stock market there are people who are trading every day so that is less than a year no why is it not under money market the key word is maturing maturing mean expiry of that instrument now if you take equity shares i buy a share tomorrow i sell it to you when i sell it to you does the instrument get expired no you can sell it to somebody else now the instrument is going to continue but here we are talking about a maturity a expiry after a given period that instrument is no longer there it's lapsed okay equity doesn't have that characteristic equity doesn't have a maturity date it falls under long term instrument why we know equity gives you ownership claim now when i am talking about this you should be recalling the second topic classifications of financial markets okay equity market was giving us or equity was giving us ownership claim if you or i bought a share that is going to give us part ownership at least for that particular one share we are going to be owner of that company now when you become owner of the company you should be willing to take both profit and loss of that company okay and do you become a owner saying okay i am owner only for one day tomorrow i am going to sell this share you say you enter into a company as a owner to hold that interest for a foreseeable future correct so share as a instrument don't have a specific maturity date it's considered as a long term instrument so it can never come under money market money market you need to have that in the instrument need to have a maturity of 
less than 12 months. Okay, here it doesn't. So equity instrument never fall into the money market category. So what do you see in money market is entirely debt instrument. That's why I have highlighted here. You see debt instruments. Why? Debt instrument gives you a credit claim. There is a time period within which you need to settle that claim back. You need to repay. If that time period is less than a year, then yes, it falls into money market category. Okay. Debt instrument which are maturing in less than a year falls under money market. Now, there is no specific definition on what a money market is. But when we describe what a money market is, we tell it in line with the maturity of that instrument. We say it's a financial market where instruments with a maturity of less than a year are issued and traded. Okay. Another key point that I want you all to understand here is where issuance and trading of debt instrument. What do I mean by issuance and trading? Issuance, I'm talking about a primary market. Trading, I'm talking about a secondary market. Okay. Issuance, you know, when you know, you're, it shouldn't be Greek to you all. We went through that in the very second topic itself. So now when you get in, you have that knowledge. So issuance is the new market that I'm talking about or the primary market I'm talking about. They are the first issuance of that instrument happens. Trading happens in the secondary market where in between two investors, the instrument gets traded. Okay. So both of those are available in money market. But only for certain instruments, you see this secondary market options. Not all money markets or not all money market instruments have these secondary market or trading options. Only a few have this secondary market or trading option. Okay. Why? Because it is less than a year, it's going to mature soon. Your money is not going to be tied up for long. Okay, it's not going to be tied up for long. So there is no point for you to have a secondary market where you need to get out before maturity. But if you take a capital market where you have long term instruments being traded, instruments for 10 years, 30 years. Can you hold an instrument for 30 years without selling, without trading at all? Good if you can. But there can be a possibility where you will need your money back. So can you go back to the issuer and ask? Issuer says, no, no, look here, we agreed for 10 years. You can't come at the end of five years and ask me this. So always you find a secondary market to support in the capital market. So there is a liquidity component. Okay. So money market, you don't find that. Only for certain instruments, you see that trading option. Okay. I hope you all are clear. Now we are going to see what are the other characteristics of this money market. Now money market is not a centralized market. It is a over the counter market. Okay. Once we move along, see what the instruments are, you will understand. What do I mean by over the counter market? I don't have to go to one particular place. And get this instrument. I can approach any authorized person, any authorized institution, and get this instrument. For example, commercial papers. There are there is Abans Finance who would issue commercial papers. LOLC Finance issuing commercial papers. Then you would find Singer Finance issuing commercial papers, First Capital issuing uh, final commercial papers. There can be several institutions. It doesn't have to be just in one place. Okay. So money market is an over-the-counter market 
where your interaction that is direct through electronic media where the counterparty knows who they are trading with or who their issuance or transaction is going to be with okay another aspect is it is a wholesale market for short term debt instruments all kinds of short term instruments now when i say short term it by default means debt instrument okay so it's a wholesale market for short term instruments where you have large denominations being invested and traded in this money market it's one of the most liquid and a highly active markets in terms of volumes of trading okay now we are going to see what are the features of the instruments that are traded in such a market obviously the instrument because it is traded in a money market should have a maturity of a year or less than a year which means the instrument has to be short term in nature okay okay oh sorry can you all see the can you all see the presentation now i hope you all can okay so short term nature is one of the core features that you see in money market instruments okay now if it is short term it's going to be obviously maximum is going to be one year 12 months okay now 12 months is something that is fairly predictable to you. okay i'm not talking about the current pandemic situation but you know in terms of a financial sense you will have some kind of a forecast okay you expect in the next 6 months okay interest rate might go up inflation will pick up okay that's what, something of your expectation you can have some kind of a forecast if it's for a short term horizon can you predict what's going to happen in 30 years where we are going to be in 30 years it's rather difficult okay so because these instruments are short term in nature they are going to carry a lower risk than the long term instruments okay due to two major reasons one is their short term maturity that itself is a reason why they have low risk now if when i say short term no maximum is 12 months there are 3 months 6 months and 9 month instruments as well now take a 3 month instrument i invest today it's going to mature in august september october end so by october end i would have a fair guess on what would be happening where would the market liquidity be what the interest rate is going to be there can't be a huge fluctuation in just 3 months that's the base expectation okay so the risk is relatively low the variability or the fluctuations in the economic variables are going to be fairly minimal okay that is one reason another reason is most of the issuers who come to the money market are very strong issuers you have central bank coming in to issue treasury bills you have large institutions can be financial institutions coming in to issue commercial papers they come with a very high credit rating okay very good credit rating so that indicates a lower risk to you okay why now that in that institution should be able to manage their need within that short term okay if their need is long term then they can't enter into a 
short term market correct if the need is a long term need like putting up a factory can i issue a commercial paper which is maturing for 3 months and keep rolling over obviously it's going to have a risk correct a higher risk for the issuer so most of the issuers who get into the money market are fairly strong issuers who have a backing of a high credit rating okay so these two reasons are going to these two reason are going to create a lower risk instrument to be traded in a money market obviously with lower risk and short term being involved it highlights that these instruments are very high in liquidity what do you mean by liquidity quickly you could convert your instrument into cash you don't have to wait for 2 years you don't have to wait for 5 years you know within 3 months within the 6 months within that short tenor you could quickly convert your instrument into cash okay so due to low risk and due to the maturity period that we are handling here the instruments in money market are fairly of high liquidity than capital market instruments okay now because these are high in liquidity the instruments are considered close to money that's why this market got the name called money market why the instruments that are traded here are of so high liquidity it can be quickly converted into cash so it's treated very close to money okay now if you have a balance sheet if you are coming from accounting background in a balance sheet you rank your current accounts into liquidity according to liquidity hierarchy right so something very close to cash is where you would book this money market instrument a repo and stuff those instruments are very on a overnight basis you keep revolving okay very very short term instrument so those are considered very close to or very close substitutes to money okay finally these instrument have a very specific feature that you don't find in capital in market instruments that is discount pricing some money market instruments are priced in a way that you don't get a interest as a add on method you get it as a discount pricing now what is this don't get confused you know how a fixed deposit operates fixed deposit operates as a interest rate correct you have 1000 rupees you are going to your bank <coughs> bank says 10% interest so you know if you put deposit 1000 at the end of the year 1000 on top of that as a add on you get 10% of your 1000 as interest okay but you have some money market instruments which have a discount pricing they have a face value okay which means you would have a imagine it's a certificate okay the certificate has written as 100 rupees okay so it says this certificate is worth 100 rupees i am issuing that certificate to you i'm saying look here this is worth 100 rupees and it has a maturity of 3 months i am giving this to you now at 90 rupees discount pricing than the face value the real value of this certificate is 100 but i am giving it to you today at 90 you come back to me at the end of 3 months i will pay you 100 the difference is going to be the interest to the investor it's not a add on percentage method but it's a discount pricing instrument being issued at a discount to the face value <laughs> something like this imagine i give you a <coughs> there's a 100 rupee note okay 100 rupee note i'm willing to give you a 100 rupee note you give me only 90 rupees you profit off with 10 something like that 
the face value is higher but the price you pay for that instrument is lower at the time of issuance okay that is a special characteristic you see in money market because the instruments are fairly short term they don't go for a add on interest method because you know interest rates are mostly on an annual basis now these instruments are less than one year okay so they fairly take a discount pricing mechanism okay what do we, why do we need to have money market so can we operate in a financial market without these money markets what is the role of money market when it comes to the financial system now remember the keyword money market highlights to you the short term market okay the immediate market liquidity the short term liquidity of the market is reflected through the money market the main importance of money market is remember significance of interest rate what was our first significance that we spoke about it is needed to disseminate or to create transmit the monetary policy it's very same purpose you have for money market as well you need the short term market so that the monetary policy is being transmitted easily from the short term to the long term markets okay so through the variable central bank is able to first influence the short term market they would immediately influence the current market liquidity okay so that will first affect the short term segment then it would create the ripple effect on the long term market so you need a short term market to effectively perform the role of monetary policy next is signaling now when we learn the requirement or learn the purpose of signaling you need to recall how short term interest rates help or support in determining the long term interest rate that's where the term structure should help you now remember out of the four theories three of the theories were telling you that long term interest rates had some kind of a dependency on the short term correct so the changes in the short term is going to signal you what's going to happen in the long term example if current if the short term interest rates are picking up it was at 5% let's say it's moving to 6 7 you expect obviously you expect your long term rates now to pick up as well let's say when the short term interest rate was 5 long term interest rate was closer to 10% now you see short term interest rate being increased to 6 and now it's at 7% still the long term interest rate is at 10 you know for a fact it cannot stay at 10 if the short term is moving yes long term has to move in the same direction so money market helps you to signal or helps you to understand what to expect in the long term interest rate as well okay thirdly fund raising now here the important word i'm using is fund raising i'm not using the word capital raising that's why when you're writing your answers the word you use is very very important capital refers to a long term fund raising requirement or long term capital requirement <laughs> okay here purpose of money market is to raise funds for short term purpose for you to raise funds for your working capital requirement which are of short term in nature okay so you can say capital raising as a purpose of money market okay so there are participants who approach money market to collect and pool funds required for their short term needs now remember this market 
gives you the low cost funding source why is it low cost you know from the yield curve usually yield curves are going to be upward sloping so what has the lowest interest cost obviously it's the short term market which is going to have the low interest rate so money markets would essentially give you a low interest why obviously low risk to you so why would they give high interest rate okay so low interest rate meaning low cost for the lenders okay so to meet their day to day requirements or their immediate working capital requirement institutions approach the money market to resolve their short term need okay liquidity management for banks now for banks when they have any sudden shortfall when they have urgent requirement to meet their reserve balances they would obviously depend on their interbank market they depend on the interbank market to borrow funds for that short term purpose resolve the issue and move on okay if there is a long term need then of course they would tap into the long term capital market okay they fall into the money market segment so that they can manage the immediate liquidity requirement okay if they have a shortfall in their bank squaring off if they have any short term in their srr yes money market is what they would dip into for short term investment now we spoke about the lender aspect now we are going to talk about the investor aspect now think about this you are a rational investor as a rational investor what is what, what do you think you want to earn high returns correct you want to earn high profits then why would you come into money market you know money market is not going to give you a high interest rate because it has a low risk which means it's going to be a low interest rate okay then why do you still come into money markets here your goal or your objective is not to earn high interest rate your goal is going to be to reduce the opportunity cost of having idling cash okay instead of just having as money balances you rather invest in money market where you are able to earn some kind of a return it's for a short term that you hold that investment okay you can have a requirement now for example let's say you have a, a repayment to be done next month at the end of august or let's say at the beginning of september you have to pay your semester fees okay but you have 100000 in your um, savings account rather than holding that in a savings account you would say okay why don't i put it in a repo why don't i put it in a uh, commercial paper okay by putting that for one month what do you what you are trying to do you are trying to earn somewhat of a better return but it's not the highest return until your requirement comes in for that short window you are trying to invest let's say you didn't have a requirement at the end of the month there is no any requirement for you to pay any semester fees then obviously you are not going to hold that 100000 just as it is you would definitely invest in a long term instrument correct if with that surplus money to you and you don't have any requirement coming in the short term you would ideally put it in shares or you would ideally deposit uh, invest in a debenture or something okay something of long term where you can get a better interest okay money market is going to give you a short term opportunity to earn some part of a better return and reduce the opportunity cost of holding cash okay finally risk management what do you mean by risk management how is money market is going to help you to manage risk 
if you have 100 million let's say 100 million is all your savings you don't have any other savings at all all your savings are just 100 million you look to invest and improve your savings right you want to earn a high return imagine you invest all that amount entire 100 million in shares in debentures which are having a five year maturity okay in a situation where you have a sudden requirement you have a sudden medical emergency you have some sudden requirement and you need money but now you have put all your savings in capital market instruments what would happen to you can you liquidate that instrument quickly shares you don't know at what price it would trade on the day that you want to liquidate it can be of a lower price okay if it's a debenture again you don't know whether you could quickly get rid of that debenture what if it's an unlisted debenture by having some amount now let's say you have 100 million but 20 million or let's say 10 million you put in repo you put in commercial papers treasury bill rest of the 90 million is going to be as long term now that 10 million is going to help you in your sudden requirement and also to manage any sudden risk that affects your portfolio let's say you have invested your 90 million all in debentures fixed rate debentures and suddenly the market interest rate is further moving up still you have another 10 million you can invest in that increasing interest rate okay so risk management is allowed in money market through these avenues because it's a short term market it helps you gives you that liquidity aspect to park some funds for your sudden requirements and to capitalize on some sudden opportunity okay who are the participants in money market who are the people or who are the entities that you would see in these markets okay the most prominent participant is the government so why does the government get involved in the money market to each they come in very indirectly they come by having central bank in the forefront okay government has the short term need they would be having some short term deficit in their budget so to finance that that short term need they need to issue instruments so they call upon central bank to do that so government gets involved in the money market but through the central bank what does the central bank do central bank also participates in the money market but they participate in the money market in two different capacities one capacity is to execute the monetary policy to execute the monetary policy they, they get involved in the money market the other role that they play is as the issuers of the money market securities on behalf of the government so which department issues these securities pdd public debt department of the central bank issues the money market securities on behalf of the government okay so in that way central bank also involves in the money market activity next you have banks and standalone primary dealers also being involved in money markets again they come in two different capacities one capacity is they come as a borrower the bank or the primary dealer has a short term liquidity need they have a reserve requirement let's say they have some imbalance in their liquidity position to resolve that 
they enter into the money market to borrow funds next so they come in the capacity of a borrower next they come as a intermediary in the money market in the capacity of a primary dealer so they can trade on behalf of their customers so one point is they come in as a borrower other point is they come in as a intermediary now this primary dealers are some a party that you would see mainly in the treasury bill market okay now there's a difference between why i say banks and standalone primary dealers so when we move to treasury bill topic let's discuss that in detail fourth you would see other financial intermediaries so there you would have insurance companies and pension funds okay so they get in again to the money market in two two different capacities one to invest in the money market instrument so that if they come across any unexpected withdrawal they can obviously dip into their short term instrument to liquidate the uh, liquidate and resolve that requirement they don't have to liquidate a long term instrument okay just like the earlier example if i have 100 million i am not going to put the entire 100 million into long term knowing that there can be withdrawals especially as pension funds and insurance companies they could calculate the withdrawal okay so knowing that they could set aside a component and a buffer let's say they know they predict last year with last year it's going to be a 10 million of a withdrawal this year as a buffer they could keep 15 million aside by rather than having it as just cash balances in your current account you could rather invest that in let's say repo commercial papers where it's a it's at a very fairly short term maturity so if you come across any sudden withdrawal you could liquidate that short term instrument and settle or meet that withdrawal other aspect is they come into the money market and invest in money market instrument so that if they spot any good investment opportunities in the long term market they could easily cash they could easily liquidate the money market instruments and capitalize on that opportunity again the same example if you have a or if you put your entire 100 million in long term you have to liquidate your all your, your long term instrument to capitalize on that opportunity let's say in that scenario the mar long term market is not performing well what are you going to do it's very it's high it's highly susceptible to risk patterns very variations okay whereas short term markets fairly of low risk so if you have some kind of an amount maintained in money market instrument you could easily liquidate that and capitalize on such investment opportunities okay then you have companies why do companies get into money markets as a borrower and as a lender they come in as borrowers because they have short term fund requirement where they would need to may have some seasonal seasonal working capital requirement some uh, very one off uh, or a one off liquidity issue to meet a certain payment then they would come into the money market and issue commercial papers now companies come as borrowers and issue money market instrument mainly commercial papers okay on the other end they could come in as a lender as well okay they are where they have some excess cash and they can park that instant money in the money market that's what we are going to see at the very last ultimate lenders who are the ultimate lenders obviously you have companies who have excess short term cash there are financial intermediaries who have excess cash government on a situation of a budget surplus they could always invest part of their excess funds in the short term market so they benefit from that liquidity aspect okay 
Now think about individuals. Can you and I, how are we going to get involved in money market? Usually individuals being involved in money market directly is very less. They get into the money market via funds, mutual funds. Through that, they would get involved in the money market. Now, example would be you have you have NDB money market accounts. Then you have first capital first capital money market funds where you and I could obviously invest in this fund where they will pool our money. They will collect our money and invest in these short term instruments. Government treasury bills, commercial papers, every, anything which are of a short term maturity. Why can't we directly get involved? If you have a minimum amount of 5 million, 10 million, of course, yes. Individuals who don't, they get into the market through money market funds. Now we are going to move into money market instruments. Now throughout this topic, we are going to study about seven money market instruments. We are going to start off with the main instrument being treasury bills. Then you have commercial papers, repurchase agreements, certificates of deposit, interbank loan and deposits, euro currency instruments and Finally, banker's acceptance. Now, all these seven, you could classify depending on the interest rate quota. That's what I have done here. Remember in the very first slide, we saw that a special feature was discount pricing. So you can see here, three instruments carry this special feature. Treasury bills, commercial papers, and banker's acceptance carry this feature of discount rate. Add-on rate is something very similar to how a fixed deposit would operate. Okay. Commercial bank loans and deposit, the interbank loans and deposit work on an add-on interest rate basis. Certificate of deposit work in an add-on interest rate basis. Repo and reverse repo transaction work on an add-on rate basis. Now, what I want you to do here is, for now, highlight certificate of deposit and put an asterisk. Because when we move to that topic, you will learn certificate of deposit, it has both features of add-on rate and discount rate. Okay. Why have I put it, then why have I put it in the add-on rate column? Because at the time of issuing a certificate of deposit, you issue it on an add-on rate basis. Subsequent to the issue, when they trade in the secondary market, they adopt the discount pricing method. Okay, so put an asterisk to certificate of deposit and just mark it, highlight it. When we study about certificate of deposit, you could write that note here. So it's just one shot when you study. Okay. Now, it's more specific into each money market instrument. Now, the main money market instrument is treasury bills. Short form, you call it T bills. Who are the issuers of treasury bills? Issued by the government via or through central bank. Treasury bill is the short term instrument issued by governments. Hence, they carry a maturity of one year or less. In Sri Lanka, what kind of a maturity bucket or what types of maturity buckets you could see for treasury bills? You see three months, six months and one year. More specifically, 
you could say 91 days 182 days and 364 day treasury bills Okay, so we have treasury bills in three maturity buckets. This is something that you need to definitely know. There are only three maturity buckets for treasury bills. Why do governments issue treasury bills? When they have any shortfall in their budget, where they need to meet their short of shortfall through because it's a short term gap they need to meet it through short term sources then they would issue treasury bills to cover up that liquidity gap that is one reason next is to settle off a maturing treasury bill let's say they already have issued a treasury bill for a budget deficit and that treasury bill was a three month treasury bill which means at the end of three months, they should ideally settle that treasury bill. They need to pay money to the investors and recall the instrument. Let's say they are, they don't have funds to settle one off. What they could use is they could issue a new treasury bill. Let's say now they issue a treasury bill for six months, 182 days. Once they issue that, of course, they will pull some funds. They can use the fund to repay the maturing treasury bill. So you could issue new treasury bills to meet shortfalls in the budget or to repay a maturing treasury bill. Okay. Now, treasury bill is considered as one of the safest instruments. Okay, safest possible instrument, remember, for that particular currency. Why? We know as the sovereign, the government has the capability to print money. Okay, because they have the capability to print money, they could ultimately, ultimately use that if they are unable to settle their treasury bill. Now, let's say I for an example, is issuing an instrument, okay? And you are investing in that instrument, which means you are giving your 10 million to me and taking my instrument. In three months time, I should give you 10 million and buy that instrument back, okay? That's how the agreement is going to be. Now, because I'm a standalone person, there is always a doubt, what if she doesn't pay? Okay, what if she doesn't pay? Then what happens? I could obviously default, run away, not pay back. If I default, let's say I have no other source to pay your 10 million. If I had the ability and the power to print currency, obviously as my last ability, I would print currency of 10 million and give it to you and settle you off. Okay. Because of that, the default risk can be considered zero. Same thing for a government security. Because the government have the ability to print their own money, it is considered as a default free risk. Now, this arrangement is for rupees. I have for example, let's say I have authority and it's rupees. Obviously, I have the authority. Let's say it's a foreign currency. I'm living in Sri Lanka. I have no authority to print dollars. Obviously, our government, this uh, denomination, accepted denomination is rupee. They have rights to print rupee. Can they print dollars? Then if they issue a dollar denominated treasury bill a treasury bill for three months but it's in dollar terms 
Now, can you say that is a re default risk free instrument? No, because I don't or the government doesn't have the capability to print money. The only way they could settle such an instrument is two ways. One is I need to use my reserve. The government will have dollar reserves. They could use the dollar reserves and pay back that instrument. Or government will have to roll over. Get a, or issue a new dollar instrument, borrow money and then settle them off. Okay, these are the only two options. Let's say they don't have reserves, then unable to pay. Let's say they find it difficult to issue a new instrument because they are already struggling. No one is now believing them to invest in a new instrument. Then again, I'm unable to pay the maturing dollar denominated instrument. Thus highlighting default risk. Okay. Now you will be wondering why would countries issue treasury bills in foreign currencies? In a situation where the foreign currency interest rate is lower than our country's interest rate, then government could choose to issue an instrument in foreign currency. Because let's say a dollar is going at an interest rate of 2%, they could make the call to issue a foreign currency denominated T bill. Okay. Now, treasury bill market has both primary and secondary markets. How they operate is they have both primary market where there is an initial issuance. Secondary market where there is a trading happening. What happens in the primary market? Who is the issuer? Central bank issuing on behalf of the government. So they issue the treasury bill. To whom can anyone come and demand for treasury bill? You have registered primary dealers. You have registered intermediaries who will represent you and myself and go to that market, go to that place to bid our, our order. Okay, so the in a primary market, it's going to be between central bank and the primary dealer. So in the primary market. In the secondary market, what's going to happen? Now here, the trade will happen between primary dealer who already bought it from central bank and the other investor. Okay. Now how does this primary market work? In the primary market, you have regularly scheduled auction process. Every Wednesday, they conduct the auction. Friday is the settlement day. Okay. And they announce it one week before. Yesterday on Friday, they issue that they are going to, there's going to be a treasury bill issuance where the auction is going to be held on 4th August. So every Wednesday, you would have the auction and Friday is the settlement date. So here they tell you the quantum that they are going to issue and the maturities in which they are going to issue. Can you see that? Can you see how this 46,000 million is made up of? Highest is going to be in a six month category. Then you have equally divided between three months and one year. Okay. Now what is this ISIN? Now these are all practical stuff for you all to know. There are some instances where even though it 
you know not included in the syllabus it has been included in your short uh, in your mcqs where you have the short term answers to short term uh, questions to write the short word ones what is isin international securities identification number every financial security have a particular unique identification number to itself that is highlighted by isin number international securities identification number correct now this code is given to this particular treasury bill now let's see whether we could get any information from this code what does it tell us there are three letters then you have bunch of numbers then again a letter then bunch of numbers the first two letters is going to highlight to you the country of issuance here it's issued in sri lanka so lk highlights this instrument is a sri lankan instrument okay all right then the third letter a a reflects this is a treasury bill treasury bill issued in sri lanka let's say it carries lkb then it means treasury bond issued by sri lanka so first two letters highlights the country third letter highlights the security so a meaning treasury bill the next three numbers the next three numbers now can you note a similar thing 091 see whether there is any similarity between the maturity and this number of course you can see the next three numbers are going to tell you the maturity of this instrument it's going to mature on uh, sorry, in 91 days it's a 91 day treasury bill issued by sri lanka this is a 182 day treasury bill issued by sri lanka this is a 364 day treasury bill issued by sri lanka then we go to the next two numbers now these two numbers the letter and then again the number the next two numbers you have two numbers one letter then again another two numbers this entire series is going to tell you the exact maturity date 21 reflects the year in which it's going to mature now this is a 91 day treasury bill they are issuing it on 4th august so in three months meaning august to september september to october october to november okay november it should mature let's say that you can uh, whether you could find that over here so november 2021 ideally on the fourth okay so here 2021 correct what does this k reflect k highlights the month in which it's going to mature a reflects january b february so a to l reflects in what month the maturity is going to happen there we saw k it's going to mature in 2021 november on the fifth why 91 days so the 91st day is going to be the 5th november 2021 if you move here 182 day treasury bill going to mature in six months time so you have 4th august by uh, 5th november three months are over 
November to December, December to January, January to February. So ideally, the six months is going to mature in February of next year. Can you see that over here? 2022, B, of course, A reflects January, B reflects February. On the fourth, this instrument is going to mature. 364 days, exactly one year. Then 2022, August is where the maturity is going to be. Let's say H is August. So here also H reflects the month. 5th August 2021, this instrument is going to mature. What is this last digit? It's a series code. It doesn't have any of an informational value. It's just a series code. All right. Now, from next year onwards, from 2022, if you have an instrument which has a maturity date and that maturity date is a bank holiday, then the following business day is when the settlement is going to happen. See, new there was a new holiday treatment for treasury bill. That's going to happen from 2022. Where if you have a maturity date falling on a bank holiday, the payment will be done the immediate following business day. Let's say today is a holiday. Then tomorrow, if it's a business day, yes, you will be settled. Earlier, it was one day before. Now it's going to be one day after. Now there's another piece of information. You and I can see in this. What is the minimum bid amount when it comes to treasury bill? Minimum is 5 million. For you to enter into the treasury bill market, minimum bid amount is going to be 5 million. Now remember, there were two markets in treasury bill, primary market and secondary market. Primary market, you saw central bank and the primary dealer. Now, primary dealer is where the one who's going to bid at that auction and buy the treasury bill. And then in the secondary market, the primary dealer and the investor are going to trade. So, does that mean investors have access only to the secondary market? No. They also have access to the primary market. But... It's not a direct access. They are going to give their bid through the primary deal. They will call their primary dealer and say, look here, I have 10 million. I'm willing to invest in a six-month treasury bill. Why don't you quote at this rate? Okay. So to the bid or to the auction process, investors can influence, but indirectly, we are the primary dealers. What's going to be the minimum bid amount there? 5 million. Okay, minimum is that and then thereafter by multiples of 1 million. Now, can you see here? The general public is invited to purchase treasury bill from following primary dealers or other licensed commercial banks. Now, you would have seen, I have used the term called banks slash standalone primary dealers. Primary dealers are intermediaries you see in treasury bill market. These primary dealers, of course, can be a bank. Your treasury unit in the bank will definitely have a PD unit, primary dealer unit. Okay. So, apart from banks being primary dealers, you have some standalone primary dealer. Who are they? They are private institutions whose job or role is to do or to act as a primary dealer. That's their entire business. They are not a bank. They are standalone primary dealer. 
here you could say equity securities capital alliance first capital and wealth trust those are examples of standalone primary dealers they are not a bank but bank of ceylon people's bank sampath ceylon they are banks who has a arm with a primary dealer unit this is the list of the authorized primary dealers as at 5th july the recent one you could get okay there you see about 13 primary dealers but already about 3 or 4 are suspended 3 in trust panacea and perpetual securities so one bank which acts as a primary dealer, their particular primary dealer unit has been suspended. The other two are standalone primary dealers. If you recall, last year we had another bank closing down or shutting down their primary dealer unit, which was Union Bank. Panacea was suspended. Their, their primary dealer unit was completely suspended. Here, the bank on their own assessment, on their own willingness, withdrew from the primary dealership. So, their, their assessment was their decision. Okay. So, these are again, why are we going through these information even though it's last year? Probable in your MCQ, you have those one word answers to give for the, let, for the last five questions in that MCQ. Probably something that you could get tested. Okay, so Union Bank of Colombo PLC on their own account, on their own willingness and assessment, withdrew from the primary dealership. Treasury bills have an active and liquid secondary market. The secondary market for treasury bill is one of the most liquid market that you can see for a money market instrument. Why, even though it's shorter, you could see this instrument being traded in the secondary market. Why? Because individual standalone investors are unable to bid directly in the primary market. Correct? It's through that they get their bid through the primary dealer. Subsequently, the primary dealer transfers to the investor. So there is always a very active secondary market where the primary dealer transfers the treasury bill to the investor. Okay. Now in the treasury bill market, especially in the treasury bill secondary market, they use this term called on the run issues and off the run issues. What do you mean by on the run issues? on the run which means it is one of the, the treasury bill that is being traded in the secondary market is one of the most recently issued treasury bills of the run issues there you are talking about treasury bills transacting in the secondary market which are old or which are not the recently issued treasury bills on the run issues, let's say now here the announcement goes as on the fourth, they are going to have a the auction is going to be on the fourth of August. But the instrument that they already issued on the 28th, so, so far this instrument is not issued. The treasury bill they issued. This week on the 28th is now a on the run issue after the settlement. It's one of the recently issued ones. But let's say the instrument which was issued in 19th July or older than that. Let's say on 14th July, 7th July would be now called be, be called off the run issues. Those are not the recently issued treasury bills. 
why do people are very they are keen on recently issued treasury bills because recently issued treasury bills could have a high interest rate okay it reflects the current market situation correct so there is always a high demand for on the run issues now we are going to move on to how you do your calculations when it comes to treasury bill how are they priced how is the interest rate calculated and what is your risk measure so what is your return measurement of treasury bills now we know treasury bills are discount instruments they have a face value but they are issued not at the face value they are issued at a value less than the fair value and on maturity you receive the fair value so here the return you earn you can't call it interest it is the discount okay it is the discount therefore treasury bills are called as zero coupon instrument what do you mean by zero coupon instrument the word coupon meaning a specific interest rate it reflects the interest rate there is no particular add on interest rate so treasury bills are not a coupon instrument they are a zero coupon instrument how are they traded they have a face value they are issued at a price lesser than the fair value and then on maturity you receive the fair value the difference between the issue price and the face value is going to be the interest or the income or the discount for the lender okay remember treasury bills always have a face value issuance is going to be done at a price less than the face value on maturity what are you going to get are you get, going to get the issue price no you will get the face value so how do you calculate this discount discount in terms of rupee terms in terms of rupee terms how do you calculate discount difference between face value and the purchasing price of the treasury bill okay that's going to be discount how do you calculate discount as a percentage now here you are going to make it as a percentage obviously discount amount divided by divided by you have face value why do you take face value it is based on the face value that you are giving that deduction okay this is 100 let me give you 10 rupees off okay so it's on your face value that your discount is going to be is that enough to calculate discount rate remember these are short term instruments so the maturity date is going to be less than 1 year so to calculate a discount rate now i have to annualize it if not it only reflects the discount percentage for that particular maturity period now i need to highlight for a year how would it be so to annualize it i bring in the annualization factor what do you mean by annualization factor this is the discount for these particular days of maturity let's say for 91 days this is the discount given okay by taking the discount and now dividing by days to maturity you find for one day how much is the discount amount now by multiplying it by 360 i'm going to see the discount as a amount for 360 days for one year what could be the amount okay so when it comes to a percentage you are going to annualize it and remember two things discount is always expressed as a percentage of face value 
there is no change in that and when you come when it comes to annualizing you use 360 days okay 360 days is the yardstick that you use when it comes to the discount rate now holding period yield you're going to see what is your return for that period that you're holding this treasury bill what is discount rate discount rate is going to tell you what percentage of a discount have they given you okay now if i want to know uh, this bottle is 30 rupees let's say 10 percent of face value of this product is 30 rupees let's say there is a stick on it says 10 percent off what would on, on one what is that 10 percent charge on the face value of this okay so on 30 rupees i have 10 percent removed off so three rupees off 27 i would pay to buy this now holding period yield is saying okay you bought this at 27 rupees by holding this instrument for three months by investing 27 rupees how much did you really earn understand the difference okay discount the point of view was what kind of a percentage discount you got that's going to depend on the face value now i'm going to see the yield what do you mean by yield income remember return to an investor can come in two ways yield and capital gain the very first lesson so here the yield the return that you are going to get the return i am going to get is going to be based on my investment how much did i invest so in comparison to that what was my return when it comes to treasury bill what is your investment amount is it the face value or is it the purchase price what is the amount that you have paid to buy that instrument it's going to be your purchase price you didn't pay the face value you are going to receive the face value now you pay the purchase price so whenever you are going to talk about yield you are going to talk about investment obviously a return is always return in comparison to investment i invest this amount how much am i getting in return okay so here holding period yield and annual yield when it comes to return i'm going to look at purchase price but in discount rate it's face value clear holding period yield yes now here we are going to look at return but return for the tenor i'm holding i don't want to see for one year because i'm not holding for one year I'm holding this instrument only for three months. So for that three months, what's my return? So do I have to annualize it? No. This is going to be a unannualized. This is going to be an unannualized rate of return. I need to know my discount, which is my return. A discount as an amount is my return that return divided by the purchase price is going to give me my holding period yield if i held for three months for that three months what's the discount in amount i have got what's the price i invested that's going to tell you give you the holding period yield okay but having holding period yield can i compare with other instruments let's say there are about three options i have there is a one year commercial paper uh, there is a one year certificate of deposit and there is a three month treasury bill i need to select which is going to give me a high return by getting a holding period yield calculated for treasury bill can i compare no oh, the 
maturities are different. So I would have to annualize the return that comes as holding period yield. Yes, you held it for three months. But if I have to compare it against a one year instrument, what is my return for one year? If you annualize this, what could have been my return for one year? There you see annual yield or investors required return. Because you talk in terms of a year. For a year, this would be your annual yield. So how do you do that? Simple. You take the holding period yield and annualize it. You have an annualization factor. What is annualization factor? Because it's short term, days to maturity is going to be in the denominator. And 364, the one year day count is going to be the numerator. Discount as amount divided by the purchase price, the investment value. That's going to get you the holding period yield. Correct? Now you are going to multiply that by the annualization factor. Treasury bills are less than one year. So it can be 91, 182 or uh, 364. Okay. So having the days to maturity and then you multiply it by the day count. Why is this 364 and why is this 360? Because when you take a return, return is always calculated for 365 days. For the entire year, what's going to be my return? Here, for treasury bills, yield is going to be 364 day count. Why? Because I'm talking about a treasury bill. Here, treasury bills maximum maturity is going to be 364 days. So, only for treasury bill annual yield calculation, you use 364 days as the count. Now, same formulas you will use for commercial papers as well. Because commercial papers are also based on discount pricing. But there, because it is commercial papers, you can't use 364. You will use 365. But remember, when you calculate discount, it's going to be 360. Here, yield is it's a norm. Norm is yield is always calculated for 365. Okay. Here, because it's a treasury bill and the maximum period it goes to is 364, you take 364 into your calculations. Now, here is a very tricky part. Now, through all these questions or through all these aspects, we saw the return the person is willing to earn. In case they give you all this information and tell you to find, okay, what is the current price of this treasury bill? What is the price in which this treasury bill is currently being traded? Investor is expecting this amount as the percentage return and so forth. What is the return? What is the price of the treasury bill currently? Then, of course, you could use the back same formula, use the backward calculation and find the price of a treasury bill. Now, here, depending on the information available, you can use the particular formula. Again, understand what the formula is telling you and then you study the formula. Don't just memorize it, okay? Because if you just forget one component, you are going to lose entirely. Very first one. Now we know Face value 
is equal to the price plus discount. Always it has a discount. So this is how it will move. So how do you find price? You find price by face value minus the discount. You will get the face value. Now here discount meaning is it the percentage? No. You have to find the amount in amount how what is the discount now let's say they have given you the discount rate they have given you the face value and the days to maturity if this is was just discount simple just minus discount from face value you get the price but here it's the discount rate that they have given so what do you do First, you have to convert your discount rate into the discount amount. Now, this is annualized. Now, remember, discount rate was annualized by multiplying it by 360. So, what do you do here? You have the discount rate, which is a percentage. So, you express it as over 100. How much it is? Let's say discount rate is 10%. You will denote it here as 10 over 100. Now, I first annualized it and turned it into one year. Now, I have to reverse that, which means reverse of the earlier. That's 360 going to be in the denominator. Days to maturity is going to be the numerator. I will reverse that. Okay. When I reverse that, I get the discount amount. Okay, the discount as a person as a percentage for that holding period. What I would get here is by doing this entire exercise, what would I get? I would get discount. Divided by face value. I will get that particular ratio. That particular amount. Out of 1. Face value over face value. I minus this discount over face value. That will, you know, 1 meaning face. Now, these are maths. I hope you are getting it. Face value divided by face value is obviously going to be 1. Okay, so let's say that is 1 over here. Now I'm going to minus discount divided by face value. What would be my answer? I would get price because face value divided by minus the discount is price divided by face value. Correct? Now this is also in a ratio. This ratio, when I multiply it by the face value, face value into price over face value, both these things will nullify and I will end up at price of the treasury bill. Let me try to draw it a bit clear to you so it's easier. Okay.
so how it's going to work is this entire this entire internal arrangement over here this entire arrangement over here Okay. This entire formula, what, the, what, what is it going to tell you? It's going to tell you what is discount as an amount divided by face value. Okay. This will tell you what this amount is. Okay. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to take this amount and minus it from one why am i doing that what does this one mean one mean face value divided by face value face value divided by face value is one so from one i'm going to deduct discount divided by face value which is equal to Obviously, face value minus discount is price. So, price divided by face value. So, how, when will I get this? By doing this entire process. By doing this entire process here. By minusing it by 1. I will get price divided by face value finally what am i doing i'm multiplying this i'm multiplying this into can you see face value over here into face value when i do that face value divided by face value both of these will get nullified and i will end up at price okay so what are the three, three, three information you need to have? You need to have discount rate, which is annualized, face value, and days to maturity. Let's say you only have face value and the holding period yield. Face value and holding period yield. We know holding period yield is not annualized. So by simply converting the formula, you let's say holding period is six percent. By just adding one plus six, and you divide that by the face value, you end up at the price of a treasury bill because you you deduct this amount, you take the return. Now, one meaning you ideally mean the price. One plus your return, your holding period yield is 6%. So, your price plus the return from that price is equal to the entire face value amount, right? So, when you deduct that, so when you divide that amount by face value, from face value, you get the price of a treasury bill but let's say you don't have holding period yield you only have annual yield and day to maturity again it's going to be very similar to the second one why we know annual yield is just the annualized version of a holding period yield. so first you de-annualize it you have annual yield you reverse it Similar to this one, you now multiply it by days to maturity, divide it by 364. Why? It's a treasury bill and I'm talking about annual yield. So 364. That's going to now get me holding period yield. What am I going to do now? I have holding period yield. Follow the same approach above. 1 plus holding period yield will be used to divide face value and arrive at 
price of a treasury bill. Irrespective of the type you use, you will end up at the same price. Now you have questions. For each question, we are going to find the discount, holding period yield, and the yield. You have two questions to calculate discount, holding period yield, and the yield. And the very final one is where I have given you all the information, but you are going to find the price of this treasury bill using the three methods, using these three formulas, you are going to find the price of the instrument. Let's see you get whether you get the same price. Okay, so this question I want you to try on your own. Be ready for the next class. We would go through the question. I have already done it here on my Excel. Let's go through that. And by doing this, there are certain relationships that I need you to understand. Okay. By doing this calculation, I'm going to highlight you. Look here. There is a relationship between discount rate and the yield. You will see that relationship through every calculation. There is a pattern you see with yield and the price. Okay. Remember, yield is the return. Price is like the interest rate and price relationship. Let's see whether you can get that inverse relationship highlighted here as well. Okay. So to understand those implications, do the calculation on your own. Refer the note. Refer that and do that. So it's a practice for you. Attempt these three questions. So next class, we'll start off from here and continue with the other instruments. Okay. So be ready for tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. I would share the uh, questions with you, the weekend questions, the first round. I have shared my email address on the chat box. Let me again share it. Drop an email from your account to this email ID. So I will drop it, uh, reply back with the question set tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you so much for listening in. Let's meet again next, next Saturday.